We're going to begin by singing two verses of When the Saints Go Marching In, and then we're going to go right into Where We'll Never Grow Old. So let's stand together and sing, okay? I want to hear you sing now. You know these, okay? I'm just a weary pilgrim plodding through this world of sin getting ready for that city when the saints go marching in when the saints go marching in when the saints go marching in Lord I want When the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in, I have heard of a land on the phone. Together. Brother Shane, I'm going to ask you if you would to voice our prayer, please. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Simon said he was glad when they said unto him, Let us go into the house of the Lord. I hope that you're glad to be here today. I know that I am. I'm thankful for the day and the opportunity to be with my church family. You are my extended family, and I love each one of you very, very much. And I, if you're visiting with us today, I want to extend a welcome to you and tell you that we're so thankful that you made your way here to worship with us today. And if you are a first-time visitor especially, I would ask you to look in the back of the pew in front of you, and you should find a visitor's card. Uh, please take one and fill it out. Drop it in the offering plate as it comes around this morning. We would greatly appreciate 
uh, you doing that. You know, uh, the Lord's really been blessing our attendance here the last few weeks uh, in worship. Our Sunday school's really been down, but worship has been up. And uh, we do have an overflow room. We don't want people to be uncomfortable in here. We have several who have been going to the overflow room. We can hold about 50 back there. So I just want you to know if this continues, uh, we may have to go back to two services. And so I want to encourage you, invite all that you can every week. And let's build our attendance back up and get back up to where we were before. And I'd love to see that happen. And I thank those who have been going to the overflow room each Sunday. They have a big screen TV back there. If some of you would be willing to go back there on Sunday, we'd greatly appreciate that. And so um, anyway, I welcome all of you today. And I want to ask you to do me a favor. Now, I want everybody here, everybody, down here, up there, everywhere, everyone welcome someone, okay? Okay, just before we sing again, just before we sing again, how many of you are old enough that you remembered pretty well those first two old hymns we just did? Let me see your hands. All right. Now, how many of you are not old enough and you just didn't know those at all? Let me see your hands. One, one honest little soul right down here. Okay. All right. We have two or three more of those older ones coming up. The ladies were just playing. There's a great day coming. We're going to sing one verse of that. And then we're going to Will the Circle Be Unbroken. Now, I need to tell you, there's a couple of versions of that. And we've kind of hustled around this morning to be sure and get the right words and the right tune and all that. So I hope we'll all be together on that one. And then we're going to wind it up with the haven of rest. Maybe just one verse in the chorus. But you stay with me and the words are on the screen. Let's sing together. There's a great day coming. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to That'll be better. <laughs> there are loved ones in the glory whose dear forms you often miss. When you close your earthly story, will you join them in their bliss? Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by, in a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord. In the sky, 
One by one their seats were emptied, one by one they went away. Now the family is parted, will it be complete one day? Will the circle be unbroken by and by? verse, the haven of rest. Oh, come to the Savior, he patiently waits to save by his power divine. Come anchor your soul in the haven of rest and save my beloved is mine. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may us to do that chorus again. I'm sure he's listening upstairs. I want us to do that chorus again a cappella. Let's sing it again, please, okay? I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. Before I lead us in, in prayer this morning, I, I got a, an announcement I want to I want to share. But I just want to you know, Vacation Bible School is for our children. And after the past week we've had, folks, we all know we live in a, in a dark world. And how many times have we thought or how many times have we heard said or how many times have we said that this country started going down, downhill when we took prayer out of school? Look in the back of your bulletin, please. There will be a meeting after the church service today in the conference room for anyone who is interested in working in the Good News Club at CBL this year. Folks, we've been invited back in. For three, now, for three years now we've been at CBL. We need help. So as you bow your heads, and we've been challenged here. Chris is challenged. We need help with Vacation Bible School. We need help with this. In light of what we see in our dark world that we live today, for us older ones, we're hardened to it, I'm afraid. But for these young people, we may be the only chance that they have. So I'd ask you just to humbly, as I lead us in prayer, you pray what God would have you do. And do something. Don't sit idly by. Heavenly Father, oh God, I just don't. I'm full this morning. This is a special week for our church, Lord. As we go out into the community, Lord, as we've already been out into the community and we've invited, and buses and vans will depart this afternoon, Lord God, to hopefully bring many that may have never been to a church, 
to hear your word proclaimed, Lord, in simple ways so that they can understand, Lord. So my, my prayer is, Lord God, that there would be many that come to know you this week. And as we continue to pray and to hope for a brighter future, Lord God, we know it rests in our hands. For each one of us that calls ourselves a believer, Lord, you've challenged us to go out and to make disciples of all men. God, there is a responsibility. As, as Joe shared this morning about the, the wide gate and the narrow path. God, when we choose that narrow path, when you knocked on our heart's door, and we answered that call. It came with responsibility. Let us all consider that responsibility in light of the world that we live. Lord, I love you. I love my church family. And I thank you for all that you've done, for the blessing that you are, and for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name. Amen. Yeah. 
Amen. That was good. Praise the Lord. Mm. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to the most important time in the service, I pray that you will help us to turn our attention to you, to your word, and to the voice of your spirit. I pray that you will speak to us and be very real to every person in this room today. I pray that we will hear your voice. 
not only through your written word, but your voice as your spirit speaks to us individually and personally. So Lord, I commit myself, I commit everyone here to you. I commit this service to you, Father. Have your way in our hearts. Thank you for your written word and thank you for the privilege of being able to stand here today and share your word once again. So bless the reading and the proclamation of your word, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 21 as we continue in this series on the eternal existence of man. Revelation chapter 21. For those of you that may be joining us for the first time, we began in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 27 where the Bible tells us that God created man from the dust of the ground. He created man's body from the dust of the ground. That body was lifeless until God breathed into the nostrils of that body the breath of life. And the Bible declares that at that moment, that first man became a living soul. A soul is eternal. It is not temporary. It's not uh, just It does not just exist through one's physical life, but a soul is eternal. And we saw that through Luke 16, where two men died, a rich man and a beggar. One was a Christian, one was not. One went to be with God, the other went to hell. The Bible clearly teaches us that there's no such thing as soul sleep and that the soul never dies. For those of us that are saved and born again, we will live forever with God. And we've been focusing on, in this particular part of the series, when we've been focusing on our eternal home. And so last week we looked at Revelation 21 and we covered verses 2. We'd already covered verse 1 and along with 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, but we covered verses 2 through 8 last week. Now today, I want us to cover verses 9 through 27. I want us to read these verses. I won't cover all the verses. There's too much here. And so uh, there may be one or two more messages in this series, in this particular part of the series, about heaven. And so if you would, I want to ask you to stand one more time and for the reverence of the reading of God's Word. And let's begin reading in Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. Revelation 21, verse 9. Now remember, John, the great apostle John, is is, uh, in exile on the Isle of Patmos, and God has revealed to him or is revealing to him what we read in the book of the Revelation. And it says in verse 9, And there came unto me one of the seven angels. Now this is John speaking. John is saying, There came unto him one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great, that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now remember, look back over to chapter 21 in verses 1 and 2. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first heaven were first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband so now he's stating that once again here in uh, we find that stated once again in verse 10 and then in verse 11 he begins to describe what he saw now listen carefully he said he saw the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God verse 11 having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, like, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square 
And the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like in the clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, an emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, a topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, a jacinth. The twelfth, an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You may be seated. There is no way that I, nor you, nor anyone else can imagine what a beautiful place this place is. And when I say this place, I'm referring to the place we're studying about here in Revelation, the New Jerusalem, the holy city, where all the redeemed will live forever. There's no way I can describe it for you. But I will do my best today to take the Scripture and explain to you what we have here in the text. And God will have to help us um, see and understand what He wants us to see and understand about this, this beautiful place that we will someday go and live forever. So as we look at the text this morning, again, there's so much here. I can't, um, I can't share it all in this one message. And so as we think about the New Jerusalem, this holy city that John saw coming down out of heaven from God, I want us to see three things about the city this morning. First of all, I want you to notice that this New Jerusalem, the holy city, I want you to see the brilliance of the city. The brilliance of the city. Notice, if you would, please, in verse 11, and I get this word brilliance from a word out of the Greek that is found here in verse 11. And notice what it says. It says, and he's referring to the holy Jerusalem, verse 10, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light. Do you see that word light? And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. That word light in the Greek means a brilliancy. A brilliancy. And so that's where I get the word brilliance. So let's look at the brilliance of the city. John says here, uh, he described this city by saying that the light of that city, the brilliance of that city was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. Now, Bible Knowledge Commentary has something I want to share with you, and I want you to listen carefully how they describe this city. And I quote, The overall impression of the city is as a gigantic jewel. Are you listening? The overall impression of the city is as a gigantic, brilliant jewel compared to jasper, clear as crystal, which indicates its great beauty. John was trying to describe what he saw and to relate it to what might be familiar to his readers. However, it is evident that his revelation transcends anything that can be experienced. 
The jasper stone, known today as opaque, which is uh, uh, opaque does mean that it's not transparent, it's not translucent, it's not clear. It is found in various colors, and John apparently was referring to the beauty of, of this place rather than the actual characteristics or particular characteristics of this particular stone that he uses to describe the way this city looked. But today, one might describe the city as a beautifully cut diamond. That's what they say, a beautifully cut diamond, a stone not known as a jewel in the first century. And one may ask the question, well, where does the city get its brilliant splendor? Where does it come from? Well, I want you to notice what the Bible says here in verse 11. It says, having the glory of God. Now look over in the same chapter in verses 23 and 24 and look at what the Bible says. And the city had no need of the sun. So we know that this, is, this, this brilliant light is not coming from the sun. It says that it had no need of the moon. Now we know that God placed the sun and the moon in the, in the heavens to give us light. What we see today, the light that you and I are experiencing right here today, if you walk outside, you see the bright light of the sun. At night, we know that God gave us the moon to shine at night. But the Bible says in this place, in the New Jerusalem, where we will spend eternity with God, there will be no need for the sun. There will be no need for the moon. Now listen to this. He says to shine in it. Why? For the glory of God. Are you listening? For the glory of God did lighten it, it being the city. The glory of God did lighten this city. And the Lamb is the light thereof. So this brilliant glow, this radiant and, and, and splendorous light that is coming from this city is coming from none other than the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God, in all of His splendor and in all of His glory. This city, this brilliant city is going to be possessed, radiant with the, with the light of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said He's the light of the world. It's interesting that, uh, you know, when we get to heaven and we see Jesus... His prayer that he prayed in John 17 is going, part of that prayer is going to come to pass. That God is going to answer that prayer. You say, what do you mean? Listen to this. We're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, how he will be in glory and how that uh, the glory will actually be radiating in and through and from this place. Now listen to what Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, verse 24. He says, Father... I will that they also, that is those who were his disciples then and all of those that would come after them, he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Did you hear that? He said, Father, I want every one of my children to be with me where I am so that they can behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And so I say to you this morning, my dear brethren, that this, listen, this city is going to be gleaming with the glory of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be the source of the light that radiates from that awesome, awesome place. And so we see, first of all, the brilliance of the city in verse 11. Now I want you to notice, if you would please, the boundary of the city found in verses 12 through 14. Now watch this. It says, and, and he's speaking of the city now, it says, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates, at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Let's skip on down, verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, the angel, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper. 
Now, verse 12 tells us, without a doubt, without a question, and, oh, and by the way, let me inject something here. Did you know that you will read after some commentators and some expositors that will tell you that all of this that we're reading and studying right here is symbolic, that it's not literal? But I want you to know where I stand. I interpret this word literally. And I believe there is a literal New Jerusalem, a literal city that you and I will spend eternity in. Just wanted to make that clear, okay? So let's look at the boundary of the city. He says here in the verse that the city is surrounded by a wall. Now, now remember this, walls around a city are designed for protection. And so... You know, I know nothing. He says, matter of fact, in the, in the passage we read this in verse 27, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. If there, if there is the possibility or if there will be a possibility of anything evil existing at that time, which I really don't think there is, but will be because I, believe, I know Satan will be cast in the lake of fire. He won't be anywhere around. So he and his demons, they're gone. They're out of here. Okay, so I don't know, but I do know that walls are built around cities for protection. And so as we look at this wall, I, I want you to see a few things here. First of all, notice that the wall is great and high, according to verses 12 and 17. It says, and, and had a wall great and high. Verse 17 says, and he measured the wall thereof 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of man, that is, of the angel. Now that, listen, 144 cubits in today's measurements, that would equal 216 feet thick. Now, can you imagine such a wall? 216 feet thick. Now, I don't know how high the wall is, but I do know the Bible says here it, the wall is great, it is wide, and it is high. And so we do know that according to our measurements today, it is approximately 216 feet thick. And this wall is all the way around this city, which lies, according to the Scripture in verse 16, four square. And I'm going to talk about that in the next point. So the wall is great and high. Secondly, the wall has, tw listen, has 12 gates or 12 entrances. So evidently, uh, they're, 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 these, these walls will possess these entrances, these gates that people will be able to go in and out of the New Jerusalem. Now notice what he says. He makes it clear that three, there are three gates on each side of this wall. There are four walls and there are three gates on each side. He makes it very clear. He says, uh, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates Verse 13 says, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. So there are three gates on each side of the wall city. And notice this, that at every gate, at each gate rather, should I say, there is an angel. God will post or an angel at each gate. I don't know unless he's there to um, not only protect but to allow only those to go in and out that are able to go in and out, according to God. Then he says on each gate, listen to this, on each gate there is a name of one of the 12, 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now one expositor stated that he believed that this was to remind everyone that the Messiah came through the Jews. I don't know why God is placing uh, the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel that uh, one on each one of these gates. I don't know. The Bible does not say, but that is a good uh, thought, um, what, what the commentator said. The next thing I want you to notice is not only that the wall is great and high, not only that it has 12 gates or entranceways, but notice that this wall has 12 foundations. 12 foundations. And in them, that is in the 12 foundations, are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, the word foundations in the Greek literally means something that is put down. It also means a substruction of a building. 
so those of you who may be builders and and uh, carpenters and you know a little bit about buildings and how they're built you know that there has to be a good solid foundation and I'm gonna tell you this is a big place we're gonna be looking at it in just a moment how big this place really is but I'm gonna tell you when you think about the size of this place the foundation has to be awesome and so he says here that there are going to be 12 foundations upon which the 12 apostles of the Lamb are, are, are written. Now, I want you to notice that um, we don't know if these 12 foundations are placed one on top of the other. One foundation, another foundation, another foundation, one, two, three, four, five. Or if they're placed individually, one foundation here, one here, one here, one here, one here. We don't know. The Bible does not say. But we do know there are going to be 12 foundations. And they serve as a testimony of the 12 apostles who declared that Jesus is the Lamb of God and the only foundation upon which man can build his eternal life. And so their names will be written there on these 12 foundations. And then finally, the fourth thing I want you to notice about this wall is that the building of the wall was of jasper. The building of the wall was a jasper. Now, jasper is a gem. Jasper is a crystal-like rock. And let me read this to you. It's an aggregate of microgranular quartz and of chalcedony and other mineral phases as an opaque. In other words, it's, again, not, it's not transparent. It's not translucent. Uh, it says that it can usually come in different colors like red, yellow, brown, or green. And rarely it will come in blue. Now, I want, to, I want to mention something here. When we talk about this foundation, I don't think that our great architect of the universe, Jesus Christ, as beautiful as he made everything down here and to think about how much beauty we're going to see there, I don't think that he built or he will be building this, this great wall and this great, uh, these foundations out of, uh, out of rock that you just get out of the ground without it, it being finished and beautiful like a gem. It's going to be the finished product. It won't be the raw material that he will use to build this wall and to build these foundations. Oh, no, no, no. It's going to be the finished product. It will, it will glisten. And so we look at, we see the, 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 this wall, the boundary, that this wall that goes all the way around this city that lies four square. So, now that we've seen the brilliance of the city and we have seen the boundary of the city, now I want to conclude this message today with the bigness of the city. Now, I want you to listen at how big this place is, okay? Follow me, if you would, please, in Scripture. Verses 15 and 16. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. In other words, he measured the whole place. And the city lieth four square. I remember I told you that earlier. And the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. Now that's the key to understanding how big this place is. The length and the breadth and the height of it are all equal. Did you hear that? The length and the breadth and the height of it are all equal. Now, according to the measurements that John gives us here in the Scripture, the city is as long as it is wide. And uh, it is as wide as it is long and exactly as high as it is wide and long. In other words, what this is telling us is this city is a perfect square cube. And guess how big it is? Do you wonder? Would you like me to tell you? Well, listen. Notice, if you would please, according to the text, what he says. He says the measurement that was given was 12,000 furlongs. Now, I'll have this on the screen for you. Uh, it should come up up there. One furlong is 660 feet. Did you see, see that up there? One furlong equals 660 feet. Okay? If you multiply 660 by 12,000 furlongs, you get 7,920,000. Now watch this. 
you uh, then divide that by 5,280 feet, which is in a mile, and you get the exact size of the city, which equals 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, and 1,500 miles wide. It is a 1,500 mile square cube. Now, that is a total, and I did not calculate this, but someone else did. Uh, some of you mathematicians may have fun with this. But I read under, after one person that said that that is a total, now listen to this, that is a total of 2,250,000 square miles, 2,250,000 square miles or 3,375,000,000 cubic miles. Almost 4 billion cubic miles. Now, to try to help us put this in perspective um, and comparing it with something that we can see today, J. Vernon McGee, uh, he says something in his book that it, it, to me is astounding. And it helped me to put it in perspective, and so I want to share it with you today. J. Vernon McGee gives a view of this four square city and he states that he consulted with a mathematician and an engineer involved in the space program to determine what the circumference of a sphere would be surrounding this square city. In other words, if you could put this square city inside a round circle, okay? You follow me? Put this square city inside a round circle. He said if you put the, square, the four square city inside a crystal clear sphere, the diameter of the sphere would equal 2,600 miles. The circumference of the sphere would equal 8,164 miles. Now to help us uh, with this perspective, the diameter, listen to this now, the diameter of the moon is about 2,160 miles and that uh, of, of this four square city now is 2,600 miles. Thus, the New Jerusalem will be somewhat larger than the moon. <laughs> Does that not in some way blow you away? At least I thought someone would say amen or oh me or something. Can you imagine? Charles Ryrie states this. Listen to this. Charles Ryrie states this. He says, it has been calculated that even if only 25% of this space, this big cube that we're talking about, the space inside this New Jerusalem, he says, if only 25% of this space were used for dwellings or mansions that Jesus said, I've gone to prepare for you, he said 20 billion people could be accommodated spaciously. Did you hear that? 20 billion. You say, now, Pastor, do you have any idea how many people will be in heaven? No. Nope. The Bible doesn't tell us, but I'll tell you what it does tell us. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Matthew 7. Uh, 7. Matthew chapter 7 for just a moment. These are the words of Jesus. Let's begin reading in verse 13. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction. And how many? Are y'all reading? What does it say? And many. Let's say it again. How many? Many. Many. There be which go in thereat. Now, what he's referring to here in verse 13, he says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. He's talking about the road of life that leads to hell and destruction. 
And he says you need to enter into, into the narrow gate and the narrow road that leads to life. He goes on to say in verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth into life, and few there be that find that gate. Few there be that find Jesus. Few there will be that are saved. So, according to Jesus, the Son of God, the architect of the universe, who's building this place, who will build it for anybody and everybody that will trust Him as Lord and Savior, He said there are going to be many, 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 many people who will not make it compared to the few that will. Why won't they make it? Look at what He says, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Jesus said, not every person that confesses, that professes that I'm their Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. They'll never enter this place that we're talking about. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many, there we go again with that word, many will say to me in that day. What is that day referring to? The judgment day. When men stand before God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name have cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? Now listen, he has replied, verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, them referring to the many who cried, Lord, Lord, who said, Lord, I've done many wonderful works in your name. Lord, don't you know that I've cast out demons in your name? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, or practice lawlessness. Jesus said there are going to be many, many, many people who die who will never enter into this wonderful place called heaven, the new Jerusalem, the holy city. Many compared to the few. And why is that? Because they did not have a relationship with him. When Jesus used that word K-N-E-W, it's our English word, but in the Greek, that comes from the Greek word gnosko. And gnosko means bottom line to have a relationship with. And what Jesus is saying to these people is, I did not know you. I did not have a relationship with you. Therefore, depart. Now they will be going to the lake of fire. We're going to talk about the, the home of the lost after we get through with this part of the series. But now we're talking about heaven and the new Jerusalem and the holy city where Christians are going. Jesus said there are going to be many who won't make it. But oh, listen, for those who will make it, this is going to be one more place. Nothing that we can... I mean, there's no way I can take words to describe. I don't think that John was able to adequately describe what he saw. It was, it was so beautiful. It was so wonderful. He did the best he could do. And so we look at that city and we see that it is, we saw the brilliance of the city, the boundary of the city, and the bigness of the city. Uh, next week, if Jesus tears and nothing happens, we're going to be looking at the blessings of the city. We're going to continue in the same chapter and maybe even get on a little bit into the last, cha uh, last chapter, chapter 22. But I want to tell you, this is an awesome place. And so I want to close by saying this. If you have a loved one that's gone on to be with the Lord, rejoice. 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 Man, they're, they're, they're in that place. They're in that place. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I don't know of a better time than right now. I don't know of a better place than right here for you to come and give your heart and life to Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't go His way, you won't go that way at all. He is the only way. He's the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him. The only way that you and I will ever get into heaven is by the, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shed His blood on the cross for every one of us. If you're here today and you're lost without Jesus, I want you to know Jesus died on, for the, on the cross for you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why he came. He came to save you. 
You say, preacher, you don't know all that I've done. It doesn't make a difference what you've done. Every person in here has done a lot of stuff they should not have done. And we continue to do a lot of stuff we should not do. But by the grace of God, we've been saved. By the power of God and the goodness of God and the mercy and the grace of God, we've been saved. For God so loved the world, even when we were yet and dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Now, you can't beat that with a stick. That's the best thing. That's the good, that's the good news. That when we were at our worst, Jesus died for us. Now just think what he would think about us and we, when we come to him and we begin to love him and we begin to follow him and we begin to read his word and pray and live as we should. Man, God loves us with an everlasting love and unconditional love. You don't have to do anything to make God loves you. He loves you right where you are, right as you are. He loves you. He may not love your sin. He does not love our sin. He hates our sin. But he loves our souls. And he created your soul, an eternal soul. And he wants your eternal soul to live with him eternally in heaven. And the only way you'll ever do that is through Jesus. And so I ask you this morning to come and give your heart and life to him and surrender to him through a prayer of faith, believing that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross for you, that he paid your sin debt in full, dying in your place on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he's alive forevermore. And he lives to make intercession for you if you will come to him today. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's what the Bible says. When Jesus ascended back to heaven there in the book of Acts, he left and he went back to heaven and he, he sat down by the right hand of the Father which is in heaven. He is our advocate. He is our lawyer. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but for the sins of the whole world. And he's the propitiation, the satisfaction he satisfies God on your behalf for your sin by dying in your place. For your sin, not his own, but for yours. And you can be justified through faith. It's just as simple as praying a prayer through faith from your heart, meaning it with all of your heart, realizing you're a sinner and your sin separates you from God and your sentence to eternal death for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and being willing to turn from your sin and repent at the moment you do that in your heart you call out to the name of Jesus he will save you and change you and give you the right and the privilege to enter in to the holy city the new Jerusalem I don't know of anybody that would be in their right mind that would want to miss such a place as that. Let's pray. Fathers, we prepare for our invitation this morning. I pray that uh, you will lead each person here for those that you're speaking to even now, those you've been speaking to through this service. Lord, how I pray that you'll continue to speak and deal and convict and draw. And uh, Lord, you'll just do a work in all of us. Lord, there's revival breaking out all over North Carolina. And it's getting closer to Elkin. And I pray that that revival will, the spirit of revival will, will break out here in this church and in our hearts and lives and in this area. And Lord, we'll see many people saved and we'll see many Christian people uh, get right with you and walk with you and be intimate with you. Oh, Father, how I pray that you'll bless this invitation time. I can't make anyone respond, but God, I know that your spirit can lead people to respond. And I pray that those that you are dealing with and those that need to come today, uh, Lord, I pray they will come in faith. Give them the courage and give them the strength to step out and to be obedient to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.